Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Today we have a rare treat. Today I've been given the keys to a Porsche 964 RS Americas. As most of you guys who know me will know, I am a complete Porsche guy through and through. I mean, the best road cars I've driven hands down. I mean, unless I'm driving for a Ferrari or McLaren or Mercedes or something like that. But for the most part, Porsche has the best driver's cars that are street legal. And that's pretty much the case for all generations, or so I thought. Now, I've never had the chance to drive a Porsche basically older than 2015. I've been very lucky to drive a few different Caymans. Um, the last car I drove actually was a 718 GT4. So I have a little bit of experience, but I've never driven a 911. So this is quite the 911 to drive for my first time. So thanks to Rich and Bob from At Speed, they've given me full reign to drive this day. I just cannot believe it. Honestly, I'm so thankful for that. So thank you guys very much. So far, I've only driven it briefly to their shop to North Baltimore near Hunt Valley Horsepower, which is the cars and coffee event we're gonna be taking it to tomorrow morning. And so far I can already tell this car is amazing, but we're gonna get into the exact specifics of why that is in a little bit. <laughs> oh my God. The lack of power steering is not so bad when you're, you know, you get going, but my God. <laughs> oh my God. I get the Metzger. I get the Metzger now and the air-cooled vibe. I mean, it's, it's definitely different. sound is unbelievable oh my god I'm <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting this honestly I think uh, this 24 hours with this car is quite dangerous for me because I was a Porsche fan before but now I'm also a vintage Porsche fan and uh, I think that's a rabbit hole that uh, some people never find their way out of so the Porsche 964 RS America what is it to help me explain what this car is really about, you're gonna hear from a true Porsche expert who not only services these cars on a daily basis, but who also raced them. And on top of that, he owns one of the four yellow RS Americas himself, along with the 997.2 GT3 RS you're seeing behind me. Welcome back everyone. I'm here with Bob Miller from At Speed. So tell us a little bit about your credentials in the Porsche space, what you do on a daily basis and, and your history in racing. Hi everybody. I run At Speed Motors and we are a Porsche only facility. So we take care of everything Porsche. We do everything for the cars except for body and paint. My background was racing factory Porsches in World Challenge GT and World Challenge Touring. I ran the Volvo North America race program with uh, Derek Bell driving for me and Michael Galati and Randy Popst. Well, Porsche and Volvo, it's a little bit different, but um, we're back with Porsche here. So we can start with the RS America here. Well, in 1992, Porsche released the 964 RS in Europe. You got a much more hardcore engine and suspension package. And the short of it is, they didn't believe that it would sell in America, that Americans would want something more comfortable, a little less aggressive, and so it never sold here. Now, with that being said, Porsche did develop 45 unique chassis specifically for the Porsche Carrera Cup, which was due to start in America. But the series didn't attract enough interest, and so the series died. I mean, it never, never even began. So they took those 45 chassis and they turned them into basically European RS cars that had been homologated for US roads. They sold them very quietly through select Porsche dealerships. They didn't advertise it. And the reason why is because this car was on the way. So the RS America was supposed to be a more driver oriented 911. Uh, when it came to the US, uh, it was cheaper, about five or $6,000 cheaper than a C2. And it's amazing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Is and incredible. honestly, Porsche eventually couldn't give them away. They had to then offer another $5,000 bounty to get them out the door. And now, of course, a C2 is maybe $80,000, and an RS America is $150,000, $160,000. With Porsche, you offer less and it's more valuable, which yeah. is, I mean, who can do that? So the real difference between the RS Americas and the regular RS is you have the C2 engine in here. Now you do have the turbo brakes and the turbo seats, um, but for the most part, it's 
a little bit more of a tamed version of the PRS. So we've got 247 horsepower in this. We have the narrow body, not the turbo body, but the European RS also was the same body, except for a very select number of cars made towards the end of the production cycle. engine note is so beautiful. I mean, the first 50% of throttle, you don't get too much response from it, but when you go full throttle, it's definitely a more linear throttle progression than you get in a lot of uh, modern cars, let's say, which really try and ramp it up to give you that feeling, or they ramp it up in the beginning to give you that feeling of a swell of torque, which is a little bit artificial, but I don't get any of that in this. So there are only a handful of options offered in this car. You could essentially add back the radio, add back the air conditioning. You could add a sunroof, which was a heavier weight option, and you also had a limited slip differential option as well. Now, they only made 701 of these RS Americas, and this is chassis number 35. Yeah, 0035, the coveted first 50, this is one of. Um, it came to at speed with about 11,000 original miles, 100% original, and we converted it to a race car. We converted it back, and then handed it to Cameron. Now suspension wise, this car is still a little bit stiffer than stock because they kept some of the race suspension components. And I can say just from a little bit of city driving I just did, uh, it's, it's stiff. Definitely the stiffest road, road car I've ever driven. Oh God, <laughs> you definitely feel that suspension though with these Baltimore bottles. And after speaking with the owner, Rich, it seems like he really gets great use out of it. He drives it in the rain, he just absolutely enjoys it, which is exactly what these cars were meant for. Now for me, the 964 has been one of my favorite 911 generation. The turbo model in particular is definitely up there in terms of aesthetics, but there is something really classy and unique about these narrow body cars as well. And it's definitely grown on me in person. The one must have thing with these older Porsches is that duckbill spoiler in the back. It's absolutely gorgeous. The iconic ducktail in 1973 in the Carrera RS. What Porsche did, they did a lot of wind tunnel testing. What they found was, was that the ducktail, instead of creating downforce, it reduced lift. Would you say that this, that, that this version of the wing was actually for downforce and that was this a different one iteration? Yeah. yeah, this absolutely is. So, you know, their wind tunnel probably back then was a hair dryer <laughs> and a, you know, a couple pieces of matches with uh, some stream of smoke they got a little bit better by 1993. I mean, even at 3,000 RPMs, it still pulls decently well considering it's only 247 horsepower. Now the manual steering is fairly direct. I mean, I wouldn't say it's uh, night and day feedback wise compared to let's say, you know, the modern Porsche electric steering. They've certainly improved that tremendously over the years. But at the same time, I'm not driving it in anchor. So on the street, you know, you're only gonna feel so much. The one thing I, absolutely adores this gearbox. You know, Porsche for sure makes the best gearboxes on the market, at least manual gearboxes. And just like the modern cars, you have this really seamless, very crispy shift into every gear. I mean, there's no vagueness at all. You know exactly what gear you go in every single time. I mean, sometimes you just have to shut up and listen to this thing. But yeah, I mean, even though this car is seven years older than me, I was expecting some sort of vagueness um, for it to feel like this dumbed down experience of a Porsche. And to be quite honest, it's shockingly similar. Well, and you, and you feel that sort of inherent DNA from Porsche. Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, they've only been doing it since 1965. So I think they know a little bit about what they're doing in terms of racing. Yeah. But the car is still pertinent today. I absolutely love the brake pedal. Compared to the modern like PCCB uh, Porsche brakes, you know, you barely touch the brakes and you're like practically stopped. So you rarely ever utilize those brake pedals. Yeah, unless I'm driving this one really aggressively, heel toe is next to impossible. Yeah. Because it does, it has ceramic brakes. You touch it and you are slowing down and you really need to depress that pedal in to get to the gas pedal. But in this, the pedal is extremely stiff and you need to give it some force to really uh, to really get it stopped. But when you do put the pressure in, it works quite well. Everything that Porsche does is for a reason and everything they do builds on their history and their past. Back in the mid 60s, Metzger designed this amazing engine and it flowed all the way through all the air-cooled cars. And then all they did was water jacket the engine still the Metzger engine and here it sits in 2011. So you've got 
500 horsepower out of a 4 liter and 247 horsepower out of a 3.6 liter. But you drive both of them and there's still a Porsche. There's still that feel, still that refinement and you probably figured out everything is exactly where you want it to be. The other thing I love is this instrument cluster. We've got five dials with the tack right in the middle in typical Porsche fashion. I mean, where the wheel, steering wheel is actually placed, you can't even see the speedometer and you really don't need to in this thing because there's only one speed and that's that's fast. Yeah, and you can throw everything else out. Absolutely. You're just looking at that tack. I mean, it really is a bare bones Porsche, which I guess is what the RS is supposed to be. Right. At the same time, it doesn't feel uncomfortable. The RS America really is such an interesting combination. It's comfortable, it's smooth, heck it may even be dailyable, but it still has DNA straight out of Porsche's race cars. And maybe in ways you might not have even thought of. Here's a, a little silly thing. So if you look at the RS America and you look at the windshield wipers, they're black and they're flat black. A lot of other folks at the time had chrome windshield wipers. Well, why? It's not because Porsche is trying to make a fashion statement. It's because the guys that were racing said, you know what, the sun is bouncing off of those chrome wipers and it's getting into my eyes. The engineers took them off, painted them flat black, and then Porsche has used flat black ever since because it makes sense to do it. And they learned so much from their racing that translates straight to a streetcar. And the responsiveness on the blips is fantastic. I mean, definitely up there with the modern stuff. The clutch is a little bit stiffer than the modern stuff. I mean, the 718 GT4 is significantly lighter than the 981 GT4. So I would still say that this is a little bit stiffer than the 981 GT4, which is the best reference I have. But there's tremendous feeling in the clutch. There's great feeling in the throttle and the brake. I mean, it really is, I would say, arguably more race car feeling. Well, it definitely is more race car feeling than uh, any of the modern stuff I've driven. You know, honestly, at these lower street speeds, I have not pushed the car yet. I literally just got the key, so I, I won't be just yet. You, I mean, you don't feel this sort of uh, quintessential pendulum effect, effect that you hear 911 owners not necessarily complaining about, but advertising as a feature, let's say. A 911 is inherently unstable. So you have to sort of think about that, an unstable car. And what it means to a race car driver like Cameron is, you can move that car all around in a blink of an eye because it, it basically doesn't want to go straight. It wants to turn and move. And you can move that weight around if you're a great professional driver faster than almost any other chassis in the world. Now, if you aren't a professional driver, the rear engine layout can paint a very different picture. I mean, it's just physics. If you have a rear engine hanging over the back, you're going to have a pendulum, which on the entries of the corners, if you're braking hard enough, will generate entry oversteer. And if you're in the mid corner and you're in sort of a coasting phase, then you're likely to have understeer. And then when you get on power, you may have oversteer again. I mean, that's just the physics of a rear engine car. But that's exactly what made these cars so special in the day because it was adapted because the, the tire compounds of the day allowed that sort of slippage and the Porsche ended up dominating at quite a few different types of tracks uh, as, a, as a result. Um, so you have to think about what they gave up. They gave up this almost a numb feeling of a, a, a mid-engine car where you can throw the car in and just figure it out. For the fact that you can put power down anywhere at any time because your engine's sitting over the power drive wheels. And so Porsches come out of a corner almost faster than any other style car in the world. Well, but what's interesting though is now for the race cars, yeah. now they've gone, or at least for the, like the RSRs and the, the high level Porsche Motorsports, they've actually adjusted it to a mid-engine now, right? It is, they've moved that engine forward. And so what they're trying to do now with a lot of geometric and, and other changes, they even have uh, downforce in terms of the bodywork and things like that. They're, they're actually trying to balance the car a little bit more. And they found that they can overcome this pendulum effect and still get the handling that they want through geometric changes to the body, the style of the car, the downforce of the car, and then driver input. So, so always moving forward. Would you be disappointed then 
if Porsche decided to turn the 911 mid-engine? Not that that's on the cards, but if they did for the road car versions, would you be disappointed? I'll tell you what, um, Porsche never builds a slower car. Yeah. So from 93 to 2011, that car is not gonna be slower, it's not gonna break worse, it's not gonna handle worse, and it's not gonna be less beautiful. Well, thank you for the conversation. Uh, I definitely learned a lot and I've absolutely loved driving this car. I couldn't have asked for a better first introduction to the 911. So thank you very much for uh, for speaking with me. Yeah, our, our pleasure. Cameron asked for the four liter, but I told him no. <laughs> <laughs>